Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament Lectionary Podcast. I'm Rev. Dr. Rachel Wren, Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at Trinity Lutheran Seminary, Capital University. And I'm Tim McNinch, Assistant Professor of Hebrew Bible at Christian Theological Seminary. Our esteemed colleagues, Rosie and Paul, are off this week, so you're stuck with the two of us. Sorry, folks. <laughs> but wait, wait, wait. Don't tune out. Don't, don't, don't switch to your other podcast. Stay with us. We promise at least a preaching tip or two, or maybe some random side trails, because Rachel is up this week, <laughs> to bring you insights on Numbers 11, 24 to 30 on this Pentecost Sunday. So <laughs> who knows where this is going to go. It's always an adventure. My students don't call me a chaos muppet for nothing. I think it's a term of endearment. Sure, Rachel, term of endearment. You can <laughs> you can take it that way. Well, where are you taking us this week, Dr. Chaos Muppet? Oh, <gasps> that's my supervillain name. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, this week, Tim, we are diving into one of my favorite Bible texts, Numbers 11, verses 24 to 30. And this one is, is slightly different from all the other ones that I call my favorites because I can actually remember the moment that this text became one of my favorite Bible stories. It's been a while since we've actually done your favorite Bible text. <laughs> At least four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the moment you're thinking of? Yeah, so I was still in the parish at that point. Um, my my call started out as a five point parish pastor in rural Minnesota, and um, in those early years of ministry, I was preaching from the Gospels over and over again. And quite frankly, I was getting bored. Um, <gasps> so I know, right? So <laughs> surprised to no one. So at some point, I started paying closer attention to the assigned RCL Old Testament readings. And I just started to find fantastic preaching points all over the place. This story was one of those aha moments where I realized just how much great preaching there is to be found in the Hebrew Bible. Not that I need to tell any of our listeners, but this is where I was. So when I preached on this sermon, I titled it, A Right Word from the Wrong Place, or, Oh Shoot, Not El Dad and Me Dad. <laughs> you should have just included the expletive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That would have gone real well. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So Eldad and Medad, fantastic story. Now, there's a lot going on in this lesson today, but the basic preaching point that I happened upon then and that I still think bears up now is that this story is in part about when God sends you the right word, but from the wrong place. There are certain times in our lives when God is telling us things that are hard to hear. Sometimes they're hard to hear because they're things that make us uncomfortable, or they tell us truths that we really would rather not face. But sometimes what God is telling us is hard to hear because of the person they're coming from. Mm. That's actually kind of a good sermon point, isn't it? I bet if you were risky, you could even have people stop in the middle of your sermon and, and picture in their minds who that person is in their life, that person at work or in their family, that they would not want to hear a word from God from. Yeah, that's a great idea. Now you'd want to like set the stage, right? And be like, not anybody in this room, of course. Um, but I, I really do think it's a good idea because that's what happens in our text for today. Now, if you're preaching on this, to give your folks the whole picture, you have to expand the text a bit, um, mm -hmm. which is what I might suggest doing. If you do, you would expand it to Numbers 11, verses 4 to 17, and then hop to 24 to 30. You can do all of 4 to 30 if you want, but there's a bit about meat in there, which gets a bit distracting since we don't finish out the whole chapter, <laughs> which is where God gives meat to the people to eat in addition to the manna. Uh, the important part to note is that at the beginning of this chapter, Moses complains to God because the people are complaining to Moses all the time. And he's just hit his limit. He has absolutely no capacity left for dealing with the Israelites. So he turns to God for help. So God says, okay, okay, get all the elders together, bring them to the tent, and we'll spread some of the responsibility out to them. Now, if you wanted, this could also be fodder for a great sermon about delegation or about the importance of knowing your limits or about the importance of speaking your limits and trusting God to support you through those limits. God knows that could be a gospel message for a lot of folks out there and one that we don't highlight as often as we should. 
I know. A good message for preachers, too. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> Preach to yourself on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you want to go that route, dear listeners, more power to you. But the other route that you could take, the one I'm suggesting, is something slightly different. So to bring us back to the mountain, God tells Moses to gather the 70 elders to the tent so that they can be imbued with some of the power and the responsibility that has been burdening Moses. So they come, and God does just that. All's well that ends well, right? (laughs) Wrong. Yeah, exactly, because it's the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) No, because, and here's where stuff gets interesting, because two of the elders don't come, Eldad and Medad. The elders, you have to remember, are the power players of God's people, the ones whom everyone trusts, essentially the political leaders. They should be the most responsible, the most dedicated, the most faithful people of the group. And two of them just straight up don't show. But, and here's where things get really interesting, they're still imbued with the Spirit's power. Yeah, that's the that's the the big twist in the story, right? right. <laughs> so so just to make things clear here, these two elders don't follow God's orders mm-hmm. and they still get the power. Mm-hmm. And since they're in the camp, maybe they even get the credit since no one else is going to see those elders with Moses. Mm-hmm. So is that is that where you're headed with that? That's exactly where I'm going. They are not there. They did not listen. They did not show up. And yet they get to be the public presence of God's spirit to the rest of the people. Mm. And Joshua, Moses' right-hand man, is mad. I mean, again, with reason, right? They weren't the ones, Eldad and Medad, who deserved people's praise. It wasn't right in Joshua's mind that God's word come from them. You can see where I'm starting to go Mm -hmm, here. mm -hmm. There are all sorts of situations that I'm sure folks can imagine where this would be applicable. When God is telling you something, but you resist it because of the person who is speaking, when you're told a truth about yourself or about your church from that person who really drives you crazy, when something gets pointed out at work by that one coworker and darn it, they were right. All of those times that we would rather not listen to God's word, not because of the word, but because of who it's coming from. And there's one more little Hebrew point that sort of drives that point home. Hmm. So the name's Eldad and me, dad. You know, if you're familiar at all with Hebrew Bible or with this podcast, you'll know that when you get names in the Hebrew Bible, it's really good to pay attention to them. Mm-hmm. Eldad and me, dad both mean something similar, or they're at least related to the same word. Me, dad, or in Hebrew, medad, is related to the word for love, beloved, or darling. Mm-hmm. Eldad, or eldad, is also linked to the word for love and beloved. But it also has the addition of the prefix El, or God, making Mm. his name mean something like God has loved. So Eldad and Medad, the two who don't show up, the two who don't deserve the credit, it's it's just a little reminder that all those people who drive you crazy, who you'd rather not hear a word from God, well, they too, unfortunately, are beloved by God. (laughs) So that's yeah. the preaching angle that I got for you today. Yes, yes. And and if you out there happen to be a, a Lutheran like Rachel or a, a like Reformed or Presbyterian person like me, the sovereignty of God is all over this text, right? <laughs> that it's not about us. Yeah. It's not about what yeah. we bring to the table as, um, you know, the, the right kind of leader or the wrong yeah. kind of leader or the ones who went with the with the group or stayed in the camp it's all it all traces back to god's choice to yeah. pour out responsibility power mm. blessing yeah and really our job is to then respond in the way that moses responds to joshua and and moses says would that all of god's people be prophesying God's word. You know, it's just this mm-hmm. beautiful, generous mm-hmm. understanding of, of God's ministry and the expansiveness of God's ministry too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Rachel, for, for bringing us that. It was really great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, folks, we hope you found something useful in this discussion. If so, why don't you reach out and tell us about it? You can find us at firstreadingpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can uh, interact with us in the comments on Facebook. 
Our website has all of our past episodes and also some kind of fun merchandise. <laughs> if you're looking for an extra coffee mug, you know where to get it. You can also click that donate button at firstreadingpodcast.com to help us keep this going. Make sure you subscribe to get new episodes as soon as they drop. First Reading is produced by Rachel and me, along with Rosie Candithal and Paul Essa. Thank you all for listening. Until next time, I'm Tim McNinch. And I'm Rachel Wren. Happy preaching. <laughs>